When you look back to the very beginning of the laser tag industry, you will find Photon, the original laser tag game that launched in Dallas, Texas in March of 1984. Joining me today is Mr. George Carter III, who is the inventor of Photon and the man considered to be the founder of the laser tag industry. I thank you so much for taking some time to speak with me today. You're welcome. Well, now... Last year marked the 30th anniversary of Photon and the laser tag industry, and you received a really nice standing ovation from the Photon players who showed up after three decades. They came back out of love for the game that you created to play in Laurel, Maryland. And I'd just like to know, how does it feel to know that Photon had such a tremendous impact that 30 years later people are still loving it? Yeah, I, I hear that all the time. Uh, not everybody remembers Photon, but uh, you know they remember laser tag and I get thanked all the time when people find out that uh, that was my invention. They say, you know, thank you. I've had a good time with that, or my kids have had a good time with that. Absolutely. Now, where did the concept for Photon begin? Well, uh, it, it came from watching the movie Star Wars. Uh, when the original Star Wars movie came out, in, I think it was 1977, um, I was sitting at a theater in uh, Las Vegas and uh, watched it, and I started thinking, that looks like a lot of fun. And I'd been in the amusement business for, for about 10 years, uh, running go-kart tracks, I had one in Vegas, that's why it was there, and uh, Grand Prix racetracks. Um, so I was always looking for ideas that would be fun. And it, it just reminded me of the childhood game that you know all little boys play, basically, the, the cops and robbers kind of game. And I thought, boy, that'd be fun if you keep score with that. And uh, I did a little research, uh, which was hard to do back then because there was no internet. So I you know, looked at some PC uh, uh, ma uh, computer magazines and, and that sort of thing, and, and concluded that it would be really hard to do. There wasn't good enough hardware at that point. So I just kind of put the idea in the back of my mind and uh, didn't think about it for quite a few years. Well, when the technology started to catch up, how did you actually begin to go from the idea as a concept to actually assembling some of the early components of the hardware and developing the game? Well, one of my businesses I had in Dallas um, was was closing, and so I, I just was kind of in between businesses, so I needed something to do. So I, I went back to that original idea. And, and started to do the research again. And Dallas was a great place to be because we had Texas Instruments and we had all the telecom people here. So there are lots of good tech people here in the area. Um, so I started to do the research. I looked around for vendors and uh, people that could do contract work and whatnot, uh, found people that could do circuit boards, found uh, a person that could do the coding and, and all that. And uh, once I found everybody and kind of ran it by them, uh, it seemed like it would be feasible to do. When you were building the process of creating the game, it seems to me there are two elements, actually the technical end of making it happen and then coming up with the rules and the guidelines and the game itself. How did you go about those steps? Well, I had to get the hardware and the software working first. We had to get, you know, kind of a proof of concept. You had to actually be able to, you know, shoot and get shot and all that. Uh, and then once that was accomplished, then it was fairly easy to, to figure out the rules. I mean, it was... Uh, I always figured that it would be like Capture the Flag, because that's another kind of classic game that kids play. It, you know, it entails defending your own base while you're attacking another team's base. And I, and I saw it as being a team sport, where you would play uh, sort of free-for-all. You'd play one team against another. Uh, so that was fairly easy. Once we did that and actually had hardware that would play, uh, we, could, we set up some mock fields and, and, uh, and practice with it. And uh, it wasn't that hard to come up with a, a good concept. Now, when it comes to the hardware itself, what was the reason for going with the reverse IR? Did you ever have a prototype with forward IR? No, no, I didn't. Um, that was uh, probably because when I looked into it the first time, I could, I could tell you you're going to have to have lensing and you do a bunch of uh, optical stuff to, get, to make the, uh, the forward IR work because uh, you have to concentrate the beam. You have to collimate it and make it be a narrow beam as possible. And I just saw a lot of development work in trying to do the optical part. Um, so I, I don't know, remember how, but I got onto the idea of reversing it. And I actually took a TV apart and, and a remote control and, and fooled around with that, and that worked pretty well. And then I found out that at the time, uh, the photoreceptors were very expensive, but the uh, emitters, the LEDs, were relatively cheap. So as it turns out, it was a lot, a lot cheaper way to do it at that time. The... Um, the photoreceptors are like $25 versus about $0.50 cents for the uh, the LEDs. So it actually worked out in, in my advantage that way. Oh, interesting. Now, when the first Photon Center opened up in Dallas on March 28th of 1984, tell me, what was the opening day like? What was that whole scenario? 
uh, chaos, uh, mostly. We'd had several soft openings with our investors and, and various invited guests just to kind of get the bugs out of everything. But we really didn't have the flow down, and we the word got out around town that it was opening, and we were just inundated. It was just lines out the door, a uh, line to get up the stairs to go to the observation deck, and we didn't have the flow figured out very well. We just had the equipment all on tables. Uh, so it just it was really hectic, but everybody had a good time, and uh, we played you know the whole weekend that way, just being being over capacity. So it was hectic, but it was fun. Now I wanted to ask you how long before you knew that Photon was a success, but it sounds like you knew pretty early on. Was there a particular moment when you just looked at what was happening and identified it as a real success? Well, yeah, that month that everybody came in loved it, uh, even though the equipment didn't play very well initially. You know, it was all you know, kind of prototype ish that uh, they had a lot of things that we knew we needed to improve. And, but all the uh, special effects, the, the music, uh, all the things going on there, the lights and all that and the fog, uh, I think people got overwhelmed by that, which was good because uh, the equipment definitely had some shortcomings at uh, probably for the first three or four months. And then we, we got it all worked out and got a second generation of equipment built and uh, it started to actually play uh, the way it should have in the first place. Now, how were some of those aesthetic elements designed, including things like the field layout and that overall atmosphere of the game and the centers, you know, with the fog and, and that whole atmosphere? How'd you put all that together? Well, if you remember back in the 80s, um, uh, science fiction was the genre in movies and, and everything. So, you know, E.T. came out then and Star Wars has been out with, uh, I think the second one was out by then. Uh, so it had to be uh, a science fiction theme. And also there was somewhat of a controversy over pointing uh, guns at kids. Uh, so we had to, you know, kind of diffuse that. But we, we had to walk a narrow line there. We wanted a little bit of the controversy because that got us publicity. But we didn't want to go too far to, to have the uh, local city council not allow us to come in the city. So, But it, uh, it worked out just fine having that genre with the uh, science fiction theme. So the design just kind of ensured people understood that there was that fantasy element, and it was a fantasy, and it was a game. Yeah, and we developed a whole vocabulary. You know, we didn't say kill, we said zap. I mean, there was, there was a whole bunch of things we did, you know, to try to get away from the warlike uh, element of it. So uh, and it actually turned out to be a very social game. It wasn't the uh, it wasn't the kind of game you know you know for the sociopaths to play. Really, it was too it was too social. No, absolutely, and I think that's probably part of why people still love it. Yeah, and you remember the, uh, the John Stossel interview by 2020. Uh, they came in there, the, the people doing the, the 2020 piece, came in there with the idea of kind of doing a hatchet job. Um, and, and we felt that as they were doing it. But he ended up having a good time, and they changed their tune and just actually you know, said he had a good time, and, and that didn't become the, the centerpiece of, of, of the piece they did on us. Well, excellent. And it certainly was successful and loved by so many. And there were a lot of franchises. Uh, about how many were there at its peak and, and how many in totality would you estimate? Well, we at one time we had, uh, I think it was in the mid-40s, like 45 of them open, um, including our company stores. Uh, we'd actually sold a lot more franchises, 70-some franchises, but a lot of them just never got totally funded and never got opened, even though they paid the franchise fee, um, particularly like New York City. Uh, had paid tremendous franchise fees for that whole territory. It never opened a single center, uh, which was unfortunate because it would have helped us. Did the franchises have much leeway in determining any of their own design concepts, or were they following a blueprint that you provided? No, they, they wanted to do their own. They thought they knew more than we did. Um, that was a major problem we had. They went off on their own in a lot of cases, uh, even though we spent a lot of time and effort trying to make it play correctly and giving them recommendations on what kind of retail location they needed. Um, the franchisees have followed um, our guidelines, did a lot better in general. And our company stores outgrossed, out-profited every other store anywhere. Uh, the one we have in, in California and the one in Dallas were far more profitable than what uh, any of the franchises did. Was there any one location that you would identify as maybe being your favorite personally? Oh, yeah, the uh, the one in Fountain Valley, California, in Orange County. Um, we'd had a couple of years of running the Dallas location, so we knew a lot more about what to do and, and doing the throughput, getting you know, getting a lot of people to play too quickly, um, and how to design the field to be bigger and, and hold more players. It could play up to 40 players at a time. Um, and we got away from that double playing field concept, which is something the franchisees wanted 
um, and went to a larger single playing field. And that was by far the most successful photon. It, uh, it I think it cost about a million two to build and equip, and it was paid for in the first year. Fantastic. Now, which one would you say was probably the most unusual location? Well, I hear, I, I had never been there, but the one in Wildwood, New Jersey, I heard it was, it was multiple story, it was three or four st- uh, levels, and I heard that was a spectacular one. The one that I, only one that I saw that uh, was really different was the one in Japan. Uh, it was it was spectacular, also. Fantastic. Now, where did the name Photon come from? I, I don't remember who came up with that name, um, but we, the original idea was to call it Laser Tag. But um, my patent attorney, my trademark attorney, said they'll they'll never get a trade name on that. It's it's too descriptive and, and generic. Uh, that if if you start calling it that, anybody else will be able to do the same thing, uh, and you probably won't be able to defend that. So we had to come up with other names, and, and photon is the you know, scientific term for, for a light particle, and since this was light, uh, you know, traveling the beam was infrared light, uh, somebody came up with a name, I, I don't remember if I did or somebody else on the staff did, but uh, we kind of lit on that and then stuck with it. Could you tell me a little bit about what was the atmosphere like over in the Northwest Highway Corporate Office? Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, we had a couple different office spaces there. Um, initially, the corporate office was right adjacent to the playing field, uh, and our engineering staff was there, and the, you know, the administrative staff was right there. And we actually had a, a side door that would go right into the playing field. So, so we were able to uh, test all day during like the weekdays when we weren't open for business yet. Uh, we were able to go in there and play games and test new equipment, new software, new ideas. So that worked out real well. And later on, uh, we needed more spaces. We got bigger with you know, a lot of franchise support, and we needed a warehouse to warehouse the, uh, the equipment. Um, so we took another building in the same complex and moved the corporate over to that. It was uh, it was a good atmosphere. You know, a lot of uh, a lot of people really into the game, and um, they actually enjoyed playing. The engineers enjoyed playing it. So uh, we had a lot of sessions about you know what to do next, and uh, we're constantly improving it. Well, that sounds like you had kind of a fun office as well. The sign on the door said uh, Photon Intergalactic Headquarters. <laughs> oh, you definitely had a good time then. We did, yes. Now, was the equipment actually assembled there? Where did where did everything come together? No, um, we, we had the pieces made at uh, various places around Dallas, some of the you know, plastic parts and then the uh, printed circuit boards and the, and the the uh, company that did the printed circuit boards also did the assembly of the equipment. So we got it over to us, uh, assembled and ready to ship. We test it and, and box it up and ship it. And we had to build other things like battery chargers and there was just a number of things that we had to do. But we didn't do any of the actual manufacturing there. We did a, a final test and, and ship uh, there, but that's all we did at the headquarters. Now, at some point, the promotion for the game kind of took an interesting turn with the television show. Now, how did the concept for doing a TV show come about? Well, that wasn't our idea. There's a company in uh, in Los Angeles uh, uh, called uh, Deek. Uh, I think it was Entertainment or Enterprises. And they approached us. Um, they, they approached us through our, our marketing staff and had an idea to uh, to sell toys and do a TV show and the toys would be, you know, the, the things that you'd be seeing on the, on the uh, supposedly an animated TV show. Uh, the original concept was for an animated show with a live uh, element to it. Um, so they, they approached us. I thought it was kind of a distraction initially, uh, but they showed that they could do real well with the, with the toy royalties and that. Um, so we agreed to do it. And um, it changed things though, once we did that. Well, how would you say it changed? Well, uh, the thing that nobody expected um, was Laser Tag, the toy company, Worlds of Wonder, getting in, involved in this. Um, we went to Toy Fair, and I think it was 1986, and uh, Toy Fair is in February in New York. And we went to Toy Fair, and, and you know, it's a dog and pony show where you show all your new stuff to the, uh, the various retailers that would come in. And so we were there and, and got a real good reception. They knew they were going to do well. Uh, the TV show was in the works, um, but apparently uh, the people from Worlds of Wonder saw it and were able to knock it off by the following Christmas. So we knew by, uh, I think, that summer that there was going to be competition. 
And I don't know if you remember the, the commercials that um, Laser Tag did. That's Laser Tag with a Z. Um, that Worlds of Wonder did. Um, they showed an arena with fog, and it looked just like one of our arenas. Um, and even though it was a toy for playing, you know, elsewhere, not in an arena, and it was it was produced by Ridley Scott, um, a really good director producer, and it was a top notch uh, production, and they aired it a lot. I mean, they they spent a lot of money airing that, and so as a result, uh, our toy company, uh, LJN Toys had the counter, and they had to do a bunch of advertising also. So all of a sudden, the toys, uh, the tail began wagging the dog. Uh, so it, it, it changed the character of what people thought of it as. Initially, it was it was more competitive, and we had a, a mid-20s, uh, early to mid-20s um, male crowd for the most part. And then after that, it, it gradually, uh, within a year or two, had gone more to a, um, a 12 year old game. And I think it was because of all that publicity from the uh, from the laser tag uh, commercials. We sold a lot of toys. We were the number one. Uh, the laser tag and photon combined were the number one uh, boy category that uh, Christmas of 1986. Interesting. So, do you think that that toy situation was a direct connection to the TV show, or just kind of an offshoot because a competitor had an idea? Well, no. The TV show was planned by by Deke from from the start as as a way to promote the toys and then sell the, uh, the action figures and all the things that would come from that. So that the it was uh, planned from the start. It never got very good ratings. It, it was aired uh, at at really bad times, like four in the morning, and uh, it never had a good rating in any of the TV stations. Um, and then, like I said, when the laser tag commercials came out, they just kind of dominated everything at that point. And, uh, actually I think laser tag sold out and that helped us sell out too. I'm pretty sure. Uh, they, they, uh, if, you, know, you probably don't remember that, but the, uh, those were some spectacular commercials and they aired a lot. You saw them on TV a bunch of times. Now, what involvement did you yourself have with the TV show? Not a lot. Um, we weren't too happy with Deke actually, uh, we got into it with them a little bit more. Uh, our staff uh, referred to them. Uh, Deke is uh, spelled D-I-C. Uh, they referred to it as do it cheap. Uh, they didn't do the uh, animated show like they said they were going to do and then bring the live action. And uh, it was an interesting show, but it you know it, it kind of lacked some production values. Um, and it was a, a, a gentleman by the name of Heim Saban who was actually the producer, and I think he might have been one of the directors. And he's the guy that came up with Power Rangers uh, several years later. It was very successful. So he kind of practiced on us. Do you remember where the character ideas might have come from? I know that some of them were named after actual players. Yeah. Um, you know, we had a, a manager uh, named Bathan Miller. And so Lord Bathan came from that. And then one of the players' names, well, actually one of the best players, uh, had a, one of his player names is Parsimal, and that became one of the characters. So... They, they tried to emulate as much of the, of the arena stuff as they could when they when they put the storyboards together for the show, um, and then they made up the rest of it on their own. So, but it was good to get in with the Hollywood crowd. You know, we were building, uh, you know, we just opened that store in, in uh, Fountain Valley, California. We got a lot of celebrities that have come out, and um, Deke is actually the ones that got us the product placement. Uh, remember the movie Big mm-hmm. with Tom Hanks, uh, and that had the photon gear there at the FAO Schwartz. And they actually got that done. It didn't come out for a couple of years after the toys, unfortunately. But uh, they're actually the ones that started that and got that place there. Now, what were your thoughts about promoting this way at that time? And what is your perspective on it looking back now? Well, I thought it hurt, actually, overall. We made a lot of money on the royalties. And we, we got paid well because of the big toy sales. Um, we found out uh, after the fact that uh, LJ and Toys actually cheated on the royalties. And I ended up suing him and winning uh, years later. Um, so they, they weren't the greatest people to do this with, let's put it that way. Okay. Well, moving back to Photon, the actual laser tag game, uh, what right. was the turning point when the decision was made to cease operations? What then happened to the franchises, and did any of them hold out and continue operating anyway? Well, the when the age kind of dropped, uh, we were able to adjust. We put a party room in, you know, and did a lot of birthday parties. So it hurt us some, but not not, not tremendously. But a lot of the franchisees didn't react to it very well. Um, and, and the Fountain Valley store in California was doing so well that we decided that our future would be in building uh, company-owned stores. Uh, the franchise thing was just was difficult. Uh, it was hard getting paid 
fighting him all the time. It just it was a it was a tough business model for us to follow. So we looked into raising funds to uh, to build out uh, the rest of Los Angeles and and San Diego and a couple more stores in Dallas. And uh, we approached some people about doing a public offering, and they said you can do that, but you're not going to have to carry these franchises because the financials just didn't look good on the franchising. So we uh, we cut a deal to turn them all loose. We uh, gave them the equipment, um, agreed to sell them spare parts, and uh, released them from the franchise contract, and uh, basically unfranchised at that point, and then uh, prepared to go public at that at that time. Well, that raises two questions now. How long did your stores stay in in business? How long were you continuing to operate as Photon? Uh, I think we stayed in business about five years. Um, and, uh, here in Dallas, we, we it was boom times during the early '80s. Uh, the, all the real estate was going crazy, and uh, but in the second half of the '80s, uh, we had this big SNL bust, and the um, we had a, a bunch of condos that were flipped over and over, and then there was a whole big scandals about that, and a whole bunch of the banks went uh, went bankrupt. And so the, my initial investors were real estate people. So they went from being great investors to suddenly being broke. So we had we started having financial problems as far as uh, paying off the banks that uh, they had guaranteed loans for. So all during this time we were going to go public, um, that was all working out, and we actually had a deal set uh to go public, we had a $12 million offering that was uh, just about 20 days away from closing, which would have built out all of Los Angeles and uh, the rest of Dallas. Um, and about uh, 20 days before that, uh, we had October 19th. If you recall, it was called Black Monday, and the stock market plunged like uh, 20% that day. It was like a 500-point loss. And the company that uh, here in Dallas was going to go to fund this said, uh, forget it, we're not going to do it. And I said, well, I have, a, I have a contractor that says that, you know, you've agreed to do this. And I just laughed and said, we're not. So that was the end of it at that point. So we'd unfranchised. Uh, we had two stores that were still cash flowing, but I had a bunch of other commitments or whatnot because the um, setting up to go public was very expensive. You had to get the right CFO. You had to get the right law firm, the right, uh, you know, big eight uh, accounting firm. So we, we'd spent a lot of money preparing for this. And then it didn't happen. Um, so it was tough at that point. Now, what then happened to those franchises that had the equipment and, and you would set them free? Did some of them continue operating? And could they use other names or could they continue to use Photon? How how did that come into play? Oh, yeah, they had full rights to use the name Photon and equipment and everything. And, and we supplied parts for a long time to a lot of them. Uh, the, the ones that were the better franchises in general lasted a long time. Uh, the one in... Um, in New Orleans, lasted until Katrina wiped it out. It, it lasted one of the longest. And then um, <clears throat> the one up in the Chicago area also lasted a long time. And the Baltimore uh, site, they moved their site, but it, it lasted a long time. Until finally, the old tired equipment just, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't run anymore. And uh, and we were gone at that point. So, um, But they did, uh, several of them stayed open quite some time. Because they were still, they're cash flow businesses. Once you pay for the equipment, you know, it, was just, it didn't cost a lot to actually operate facilities. Wow. Now, what are your thoughts about some of the various efforts over the years to reinvigorate the Photon brand with some of the up-and-coming franchise possibilities? Well, I was always in favor of that, that somebody could do it, but um, nobody ever succeeded. Uh, it, it was it was a good effort, but I don't think anybody really had the money behind it. And that was always our problem. It was, really, it was so hard to fund something like that. Uh, you know, uh, um, an idea that was totally new, a new concept, it, that was always a battle trying to get... Uh, it's funding, um, and I suppose people coming along later on had the same problem. Now, what were the plans for advancement of the equipment if Photon had continued? Do you have anything to share, maybe about the introduction of the visible beam phaser? Well, we had a, a you know a faux uh, phaser uh, with a, with a beam that was made by a xenon flash, so we actually uh, actually fielded that. It was one of the one of the improvements. It made a, a white uh, beam that would go out, and you can see it in the uh, in the fog. Back then, you weren't allowed to use lasers. There was a um, government agency. It was the um, called the Bureau of Radiological Health, and you weren't allowed to point lasers at people. This was before the laser pointers. They were just coming on late in the 80s, and we couldn't get approval to do that So because of eye safety, supposedly. So we, we came up with that xenon flash, which worked pretty well, 
in the it was installed in the, in the company stores and, and I, I recall I think we may have had a couple of franchises that did that also. Um and it worked well. And we had a whole um, ne- next generation design already uh, figured out. We were gonna eliminate the helmets um and go to more of a a little bigger um like more like a vest but not not a full vest. And uh, the phaser and we're gonna we're still retain the battery though because at that time better batteries hadn't come along yet. So yeah, we had plans to do all that. And you know, the plan was to build out all the you know the company stores. Um so we wanted the next generation, you know, to go into new places. Well, that being said, what would you say to the players who say photon isn't photon without the helmet? Well, I kind of agree in a way, um, but you also have kind of a kind of a not sort of health problem, just kind of a grungy problem. So we we had to wear those uh, uh, surgical uh, liners, you know, the, the caps everybody wore, and a lot of people just didn't like sticking their head in the sweaty helmet. Uh, it, it was designed on purpose with the sides the way they were to kind of restrict your peripheral vision. It kind of gave you tunnel vision, and that helped the uh, the immersion into the game. And then having the, the speakers right there in your ears uh, helped a bunch. So, and then the face shield helped to keep getting from getting a phaser in the eye. And uh, that's why we allowed people to run and, and play it more athletically than what goes on now. Uh, but we, it was still a problem from the you know suiting up, and, and this is a number of people just said like uh, putting on a sweaty helmet. What do you think of laser tag today and how it compares with photon? Well, it's really well done as far as the equipment and um I don't agree with some of the arenas i didn't I didn't like the uh, uh the neon colors they went through and the black lights and all that there was an era of that um and in the nineties it wasn't very good at all in my opinion it was just um they didn't even have real time scoring i mean a lot of the the systems people came up with quickly weren't very good. But the ones that survive, the, you know, going today are all very good equipment. Uh, batteries last a long time. Um, but everything's scaled down. Um, very few arenas are just laser tag now. They're, uh, there's, there's a few of them around still. They're, they're kind of like the, uh, kind of like the anchor for an amusement area. Uh, but most of them are, are going to these family entertainment centers and, and being a smaller piece of a, of a different enterprise. Um, and they're all, they're all well run and their the equipment works great, but they're not athletic like they used to be. They're not as as competitive as it used to be. Um, there might be insurance problem or whatever, but uh, but they don't. You know, you're not allowed to run at most of them at this point. Do you have any thoughts about the competitive scene today? Like, do you have thoughts about the Armageddon, the multi-system, multi-team tournament situation? Yeah, I've, I've been aware of it. I've never been to one, and uh, you know, I think it's a great idea to do that. And uh, that was something the players, the photon players, invented that part themselves. Uh, we started league play uh, early on. It was like on a Wednesday night, and that went so well that uh, the teams would actually travel at, at their own expense to other franchises to challenge the, the good players there. So that, uh, that that something the players invented basically, and we we supported it. You know, we helped however we could. But that's always been, in my opinion, you know, the best part of it is these. You're competing against another human, which takes it away from the computer game aspect. What would you say is your fondest memory of Photon? Hmm. Um, I really enjoyed building the places, and I enjoyed um, upgrading the equipment, doing all that part, you know, the mechanical and electrical engineering and all that went into it, and the construction of the sites and all that. That was always the part that I, I, I enjoyed the most. Running the business and trying to raise money all the time was the part I hated. Um, but it was always gratifying to see everybody coming out laughing and, and smiling and having a good time. I used to hang out in the parking lot there at the Dallas location, and I, I kept a low profile. Nobody knew who I was for sure. And uh, I'd listen to people coming out and hear complaints and things they liked. And, and we'd go back in and, and make some changes based on that. And it, it's a lot better to, to li- overhear what people were saying than it is to ask them the questions because they never want to tell you uh, something you might not like. I was able to uh, eavesdrop and, and get a lot of good information. Well, very smart figuring out your market. Now, at what point did you recognize that Photon still has such an appreciative following all these years later? Well, I kind of, uh, I wasn't a little happy with the way it ended, you know, with all that, all that effort we did in the public, and then it just suddenly was gone. And I spent a couple of years, you know, like I said, collecting from people that owed us money, uh, like, like the toy company and that. Uh, so I kind of ignored it for a few years there. Um, but there was a, um, 
when Eric Guthrie came to uh, Dallas, we had the IAAPA show, the music park show, it was in Dallas one year, and I met with him there. And I was really surprised to see that many laser tag companies. There was there was like six or eight of them there representing. And uh, so then I realized, okay, this thing's going to keep going. Um, and uh, the, the, the photon part of it, and having all the hardcore players, all the ones that are really, really into it, uh, I realized that that was a big deal when there was a website called Beam Sport that uh, was that, that uh, went online a few years ago, and I started reading some of the things there about all the fond memories that everybody had, and I found out that almost every site um, had this hardcore group of players that uh, they made some of their best friends there. Uh, a lot of them married each other, uh, so it was a uh, it was a really uh, a high point in their life in a lot of cases. Now, last year, there was FOCON, which was a 30th anniversary celebration held in Laurel, Maryland at XP Laser Sport. And another FOCON celebration is being planned in Maryland for 2015. What would you say to the players who still love Photon to this day and are so willing to travel from all over the country to continue enjoying your game? What would you say to them? Go for it. Have have fun. And so as long as they can keep that old equipment playing, you know, do it, you know. And I, I was amazed at how what good a job they did at putting that back together and making it work um, at the 30th. Uh, the stuff all played real well. Uh, I was really impressed with the job they did. Excellent. Well, are there any final thoughts that you'd like to share? Um, stay tuned. I'm working on a new way to play laser tag. Ooh. And um, you'll hear about it next year. <laughs> I'll put you Excellent. on. I'll put you on the. I'll put you on the press release list, so you'll you'll hear about it. That's fantastic. Perhaps we can talk again then. Okay. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking some time to talk with me today. Mr. George Carter III, inventor of Photon and founder of the laser tag industry, thank you for providing us with the game that has given us so much enjoyment over all these years. Thank you.